Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. Let folks in. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's uh, right at 1230 right now. Um, we'll wait another uh, minute or so as people continue to join and we'll get started um, soon um, so we can stay on schedule. Um, but good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today. All right, so it is um, saying 1232 on my clock. Um, so we'll get started today. And for folks that are joining late um, and for all folks, this uh, uh, meet and greet today, this meeting is being recorded as well as being live streamed onto our YouTube channel. Um, so if you miss anything or if you, uh, you can always go back to the recording to listen um, again. So first of all, thank you everyone for coming to our meet and greet today um, as we talk about the Washington Climate Assembly. On behalf of the Washington Climate Assembly, we are pleased to welcome you all to this virtual legislative meet and greet to announce the recommendations of Washington's first ever climate assembly and the first climate assembly in the United States. We wanna give a special welcome to our Washington senators and representatives um, who are attending this session today. Uh, the Climate Assembly included uh, convening 77 assembly members who came together over the course of seven weeks to learn about, discuss, deliberate, and recommend climate mitigation solutions to be considered by the Washington State Legislature. The assembly members came from a broad range of demographic and political backgrounds and came to agreement on a set of recommendations that we're thrilled to share with you today. Uh, as a reminder, again, this is being recorded and live streamed onto YouTube. Before we proceed, um, we also want to just uh, do a land acknowledgement, even though we're virtual. And we wish to acknowledge that the people of Washington State live and work on the traditional lands of the Indigenous peoples who've been here since time immemorial. There are 29 federally recognized tribes and seven non-federally recognized tribes within the boundaries of Washington State. Tribes and tribal peoples have bring thousands of years of traditional knowledge to this present moment. Tribes bring an important and vital voice to the current conversation and we honor all of our tribal relations. We would also like to thank and acknowledge all the co-sponsors shown on this slide, additional legislative uh, folks who are here today and for all of those who've provided feedback on the recommendations uh, throughout our assembly process. Uh, to just give a sense of uh, who are some of the folks you'll be hearing today. So you'll be hearing um, from myself on behalf of the coordinating team. We also had an independent research team. So John Roundtree will be presenting on behalf of that research team. And you'll also be hearing from seven assembly members who will be presenting on a series of recommendations um, uh, that resonate with them. For a point of process, uh, we wanna welcome everyone. We'll transition to an overview of the Washington Climate Assembly. Then we'll uh, transition to some of the recommendations presented by our assembly members and then end with reflections and testimonials from assembly members, and then offer a chance for a Q&A period, an opportunity for you all to ask questions to the coordinating team, the research team, and the assembly members. So uh, now we're gonna transition to providing an overview of the Washington Climate Assembly. So we're gonna walk through what a climate assembly is, who its members are, when it took place, why now, and how the assembly was structured. 
So the Washington Climate Assembly takes the form of a people's assembly. A people's assembly is a democratic process that seeks to answer a question or solve a problem facing a community in a way that fairly represents the interests of people from all walks of life. An assembly can center around any topic. And so the one we did here in Washington, the Climate Assembly, is one that centers around the problem of climate change. The concept of assemblies have been used historically and worldwide to help shape the work of governments. At an assembly, members learn about issues, take time to discuss with one another, and then make recommendations about what should happen. Though growing in popularity in Europe, the Washington Climate Assembly is the first climate assembly in the United States and the first people's assembly in Washington state. This whole process uh, took over, took uh, happened over the course of six months, beginning in October and ending in late February. <laughs> There were two main parts of this whole project, the design phase, which included the process in determining the rule book, which set the standards of how we ran our, run our assembly, the scoping question, who our presenters are, and recruiting assembly members. The assembly phase, you can see here in the purple, was when we actually convened the assembly over the course of seven weeks. Throughout this entire time, we also had a monitoring team that served as, as an independent watchdog of the coordinating team to ensure we were adhering to the rule book. During the convene assembly phase, it was broken up into three distinct parts. The first one was the learning sessions, so where assembly members heard from almost 50 experts and interested parties about a range of climate topics and had opportunities to ask questions to these experts and interested parties throughout the process. We had a total of seven learning sessions spanning the basics of climate change science to learning about the social, technical, environmental, economic, and political aspects of climate change and climate mitigation. Following the learning sessions, we had five deliberative sessions that took place. In these deliberative sessions, assembly members had the chance to talk about what they learned from the experts and presenters, what they learned from each other, and also discuss their own views and priorities while weighing the stances of other assembly members to help shape recommendations. Uh, all of these sessions happened over the courses of Tuesday evenings, which were two hours long, and Saturday mornings, which were three hours long. And finally, at the end of the deliberative sessions, we had a final voting session, um, which was on February 27th. And in the session, assembly members factored in public comments received during the public comment period and voted on recommendations to pass to the state legislator through a secret ballot. Acknowledging that the meetings would be virtual, the coordinating team did everything uh, to ensure that we could build community and replicate uh, that would uh, that could be replicated in in-person meetings as well. We designed agendas to make sure that we build an online community through the course of the seven weeks we had together, relying on breakout rooms and small group conversations, time for reflections, pulse surveys, and feedback surveys after each session so we can continuously improve the process. We also ensured that this process was accessible and equitable for all, providing equipment such as laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, microphones, video cameras, and mailed materials to any assembly member that needed it so we can reduce their barriers to participate in this assembly process. And from this, uh, the assembly members were tasked to answer this scoping question. How can Washington State equitably design and implement climate mitigation strategies while strengthening communities disproportionately impacted by climate change across the state? We also wanted to give a who the Climate Assembly is. So the Washington Climate Assembly had 77 members that were essentially a microcosm of Washington State. The assembly was representative of, was gender balanced, was representative of age, congressional district, income levels, race and ethnicity, education levels, as well as a range of opinions about climate change. Because of this, throughout this process, we aim to lead and learn and deliberate about climate mitigation in a way that considered this whole range of perspectives and experiences. So now I'm going to hand it over to John Roundtree, who's part of our research team, to discuss some of the results um, that, they dis that they found. Hi, good afternoon. So as Mike said, 
Uh, I'm a member of the research team who's doing an independent evaluation of the Climate Assembly. So we're scholars and professors who do research and evaluations on deliberative processes like the Assembly. And the coordinating team just asked me to share a really quick data point with you from the surveys that we gave to Assembly participants really throughout the process to kind of gauge their perceptions of what was going on. And one of the survey measures that we use to evaluate the quality of a process like this is organizer and staff bias. So we wanna see essentially are facilitators putting their thumb on the scale uh, or are they running a neutral process? And this graph shows participants responses across the assembly to the question, did the assembly organizers and staff show a political bias in today's meeting or did they remain neutral? So after the fifth learning session, when we administered the first survey, 18% um, of respondents reported a liberal bias, while 82% reported the organizers remain neutral. But you'll notice uh, across the next three surveys, the percentage of respondents answering that organizers remain neutral actually steadily rose until it peaked at 98%. And then it dipped down a bit again in the final session to 90%. One thing you might also find interesting is that in the final survey, uh, respondents perceived both liberal and conservative bias of those who reported that. Um, and that's not unusual for a process like this. So despite the dip in the last session, I think the overall takeaway from this is that the vast majority of the respondents by the end of the assembly believed that the organizers remain neutral. And that's really good. That's what you would hope to see in a process like this. And I can answer any questions at the end. Great, thank you, John. So moving on um, and building off of what John said is the question of how did we get to our recommendations? So prior to forming the recommendations, the assembly members created and voted on a set of priority principles that they felt should underpin the assembly in legislative action. These priority principles were formed in the very first deliberative session and essentially served as a North Star in how the assembly evaluated the proposed recommendations and all subsequent deliberative sessions and in their final vote. Finally, in our last session, we held the final vote on all proposed recommendations. So within the assembly process, it's designed for recommendations to emerge through a deliberative de democratic process. But for a recommendation to be approved, there are high thresholds for each recommendation needed to pass. In the final vote, assembly members were asked to secretly vote on each proposed recommendation using a ballot that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, ranging from I strongly agree to I strongly disagree. The top three ballot choices, I strongly agree, I agree, and I agree with some reservations, indicate support to varying degrees for a recommendation. So for a recommendation to be approved by the assembly members, it needed to receive at least 80% of support from all assembly members and have a strength of support score or an average of all points granted to be of 1.75 or more. So in that case, if a recommendation did not meet both of these criteria, then we did not consider it an approved recommendation. And so at the end, we approved approximately 140 recommendations that were approved by the Climate Assembly members. So I'm now going to hand it over uh, for the, some of the Assembly members to present on some of these recommendations themselves. Um, for this portion, we're going to turn off the PowerPoint so you can have some more face-to-face -face interaction with the Assembly members themselves. So the very first Assembly member I'm going to introduce is Steve from Bellevue who will be presenting on some of the recommendations related to the transportation sector. Hi, everyone. Uh, so happy to be uh, joining you all today. Uh, so in the expert presentations, we learned that significant greenhouse gas emissions in the state are due to ground transportation. Uh, so we had several recommendations uh, to help address that, and uh, I'll talk about a couple of them here. Uh, so the first one was uh, we recommend incentives for purchasing electric vehicles. Uh, examples of that are uh, availability of grants to low-income residents uh, to help purchase electric vehicles and a reduction of sales taxes on electric vehicle purchases. So just a, a couple examples to help ground that uh, recommendation. 
And then the second one was uh, we recommend adopting zero emission standards uh, for all vehicles used for uh, delivery shipment purposes or other high occupancy vehicles over a certain size and weight. And uh, given that the high use of the, given the high use of these vehicles, we, we thought it made sense um, uh, it would have a higher impact on reducing greenhouse gases due to the high use and place more responsibility on businesses that are making a, a, a profit from that heavy use. Great, thank you so much, Steve. I'm now gonna hand the mic over to Curtis from Kirkland, who's gonna be presenting on some of the recommendations related to energy. All right. So yes, we uh, uh, we arrived at a few recommendations. One was about providing uh, cap zero interest loans and grants for solar and other renewables so that there's more access to renewable energy uh, that's produced locally uh, throughout the state and make that available to primary uh, residences and small businesses. And um, the discussion from this, we felt like the, um, it's very hard for someone to be able to make the upfront investments, uh, even with the cash subsidies for, uh, uh, for uh, efficiency improvements, uh, without having to have a large outlay of funds. And so maybe the state would be able to step in here and help subsidize uh, loan programs that are uh, partnership with uh, banks and financers in order to make those investments uh, more accessible and ultimately have a lower uh, outlay in the, uh, um, in the monthly fees that people are paying for energy consumption in their homes. Uh, second, I, agriculture is actually very important to the state. I, I hadn't realized that uh, Washington is uh, is the largest producer of 11 different agricultural commodities uh, out of all the states in the U.S. And so we uh, thought that we should provide incentives for farmers to uh, grow crops in a way that can help reduce the carbon impact. Uh, I hadn't realized that Carbon uh, is uh, is released from the soil from uh, uh, from from fungus and bacteria that is in the soil when it's tilled, and so there's a, a lower impact um, uh, practices for farming that can reduce that impact and uh, is able to make sure that we keep sustainable uh, uh, sus sustainable this very important uh, segment of agriculture and uh, our economy in Washington. Great, thank you so much, Curtis. I'm now gonna introduce Catherine um, from Bainbridge Island, who's gonna be talking about some of the natural solutions uh, recommendations. Um, also a point of process, uh, earlier this morning, uh, we sent uh, the full list of recommendations to all the participants registered today. So you can reference that and hopefully follow along. So I'll hand the mic to Catherine. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you all for being here. I'd like to bring your attention to the section on natural solutions, especially NS1.2, financially support farmers to encourage the transition to regenerative properties, including crop rotation, low and no-till, to help with the soil carbon sequestration. We discovered that low and no-till means that we work with the soil carbon sponge that builds climate resilience. And we elicit the help of the true biological workers, the insects, the fungi, the worms, the bacteria, and the plant roots to rebuild soybean, excuse me, soil's carbon sequestration and increase its ability to produce higher yields. We know that federal farm subsidies only uh, benefit the top 20% of US farms and that 80% of our farms, likely where the consciousness lies, to build regenerative soils needs our financial support. Another step may be to provide grants even to the micro farming communities to grow nutrient dense crops closer to cities to lessen the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. Also NS1.7 rapidly phase out clear cutting and the use of synthetic fertilizers. We can use variable density thinning to reduce overcrowding and still retain our forests capable of sequestering carbon rather than becoming barren land. Phasing out synthetic fertilizers means we keep the green growth, 
containing nutrient-rich soils that native species thrive in. We lower our fire levels when our forests are properly managed, and then they are able to retain moisture, which also prevents flooding while cooling the atmosphere. By eliminating clear cutting and toxic fertilizers and planting as much as possible, we are supporting our forests as working ecosystems rather than just trees. It is time to place a greater emphasis on carbon sequestration than simply seeing them as timber. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm now going to uh, hand the mic over to Barry from Bellevue, who's going to be touching on recommendations related to the circular economy. Thank you for this opportunity. It's an honor and a privilege to talk to federal states lawmakers. In short, a circular economy designs out waste and pollution, keeps products and materials in use, and regenerates natural systems, moving us out of the current take make and waste linear economy we're currently in. The following recommendations were approved by our assembly members at over 95%. Raise consumer awareness on the benefits of carbon policies by demonstrating the true cost of carbon and keeping it in the forefront. Educating Washington citizens on the benefits, not costs of mitigation. We all breathe the same air. This education can begin in schoolrooms, municipalities, social networks, PSAs, and the media. Some fun could be had with this initiative with Washingtonians coming up with art, messaging, and verbiage that is understandable by all. Community engagement and education go a long way. Identify and expand statewide recycling requirements and establish composting standards that benefit natural systems such as agriculture. Recycling is a difficult business model, and with state issues surround the types of materials that can be recycled and the number of locations available to Washingtonians. Consumers want to do their part, but in many cases, a center is not close to where they live. Reducing food waste will help, but remember composting and recycling by themselves will not solve our climate challenge. But everyone, company and city can do their part. One plastic bottle, or one food scrap at a time. Incentivize and the manufacturing of reusable materials and production of recyclable materials. With the rapid change in technology and materials, many plant-based these days, manufacturers will welcome the ability to waste less and perhaps profit more. Assistance from legislators like yourselves who are privy to a much deeper view along with our state government can help mentor and guide these businesses in new materials and production techniques, keeping manufacturing vibrant in our state. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much, Barry. I'm now gonna hand the mic to Juanita from Pullman, uh, who's, who's gonna talk about some of the social policies and the recommendations uh, from the assembly. Hello, um, thank you for being here today. and giving our voice a real voice. We really, this has been an exciting adventure and a learning and education for all of us, I think. And so for you hearing us out, that's very important. We, it's very special. Um, I'm talking about holding regular climate assembly series, especially as knowledge and participation grows to make sure we are on the right track. This one received over 96% of the vote. And this was not just like, we don't wanna do more statewide ones necessarily, but community level assemblies so that on a community level, the needs are being met and communities aren't being disproportionately impacted by the overall decisions being made. And the other one that I have today is to examine impacts regionally, especially among our neighbors in the Pacific Northwest. So what Washington state does affects Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and we care about that as residents of Washington state. We don't wanna do what's good for us and harm the regions around us. And during the assembly, it was definitely voiced that people understood that this is a world 
nationally issue, not just a Washington state issue. And so I heard several times there was concern about where the battery waste goes, is it going to another country? And so we would ask you to be mindful of that, not just what's happening in Washington state, but what's the overall big picture? Because in reality, this is a world problem, not just a Washington state problem. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Juanita. I'm going to uh, now transition over to Travis from Snohomish, talking about the recommendations related to education and communication. Hi, everyone. Thank you definitely for taking the time uh, to hear us out on this. I wanted to talk a little bit about education and communication, um, which is the idea that we, we're going to promote community involvement, um, improve public opinion, and pass on lessons that we've learned uh, through this climate crisis so we don't repeat our mistakes. The first one I wanted to talk about is EC 1.1, um, which is create easy to understand annual progress reports on various environment metrics to see our progress and where to put more resources in the future. Why we think this one is important, um, it's gonna help us track progress for people who are overwhelmed and exhausted, they can see actual progress being made. Um, and for people who are pessimistic about where their money is being spent, they can see that that money is having an actual impact and that we're considering where we need to be putting that money to have the biggest impact. The other one I wanted to talk to is EC 2.1, which is create consistent climate change messaging in public service campaigns focused on building hope and actuating change and building a sense of pride of American advancement not just a public service announcement. So this one in particular, I thought a little bit unnecessary at first, but after talking with more people from the Climate Assembly who had different perspectives than I did, um, I can see how there are people who would definitely benefit from a different messaging, uh, one that focuses on prosperity and success rather than the doom and gloom that is so often associated with climate change. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Travis. And last but certainly not least, we have Teresa from Tacoma, who's gonna be uh, giving an overview of some of the recommendations related to governance. Thank you, Mike. It's my honor to be here today. I am going to be talking about the honoring and strengthening of our tribal sovereignty relationships. I'll uh, pay, call your attention to G13, which is to ensure that equal inclusion of indigenous ways of knowing and traditional ecological knowledge when making climate change legislation. Require free, prior, and informed consent from tribes for the passing and implementation of climate change policies. What I will add to that is our indigenous communities have a vital role in developing climate resilient projects using deep historical knowledge of environmental cycles for centuries. We have much to learn from them. G14 is an approach for legislative proposals with acknowledgement that past actions taken by the government have unfairly infringed on and negatively impacted Native nations' sovereignty, autonomy, and interests. Acknowledging that they are their own best representatives while creating space for tribal equal participation and ensure steps are taken to prevent, prevent this from happening again in the future. The climate changes continue to affect all of us, but in particular, they, they affect hunters, fishers, the, the continued rising of the sea levels have led to salination of fresh water, which in then turn affects food creating security and tr scarcity and tr affects their traditional medicines, which we could all benefit from. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here today. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa. And just wanting to reiterate, thank you to all of our assembly members who um, offered their time uh, to present on some of these recommendations recommendations, as well as the assembly members who also joined today's meetings, um, but not presenting. We just want to extend and just reiterate our deepest gratitude for all of your participation and, and contributions throughout this process. 
Um, before, uh, we're going to go over testimonials uh, from assembly members in a second. But before we do that, I also wanted to briefly mention um, in relation to these recommendations, uh, in the packet that you got earlier today, there should have been a series of three pages where we crosswalk our recommendations with current legislation that's being proposed in this legislative session. Um, we uh, This crosswalk is by no means comprehensive. Uh, this crosswalk was a way for us to just do a cross check of the recommendations that the assembly members approved with the legislation that our presenters during the learning sessions touched upon. Uh, so with that said, there could also be additional policies and legislation that is in this legislative session um, that could uh, already be an opportunity to implement some of these recommendations. So next, uh, we're going to share our screen again and just provide some of the testimonials from assembly members and the reflections from them. And so uh, one of the questions we ask them is, what is your biggest takeaway from the Washington Climate Assembly? And one of our assembly members said, we can start to meaningfully solve big problems if we bring people together to talk about it. This assembly was a shining example of that. Another question we ask is, what results would you like to see happen from our efforts at Washington State's first climate assembly? And one person said, I would love to see the many of these proposals go into effect. I would love to see Washington State decrease its carbon emissions as a result. And finally, we had another question, the same question about what results would you like to see happen? And another person said, I was encouraged to see that a random sampling of residents from across the state could come together and have such productive discussions and consensus about climate change issues. I think a lot of these testimonials really, uh, again, show the strength and the power of deliberative democracy, having a representative sample of uh, residents coming together, deliberating on tough issues and offering recommendations. So with that, I again wanna thank you all. Uh, we're now gonna transition into a question and answer period. So um, for folks uh, who are on the call, we definitely encourage you to type in questions to the chat. Um, and we can use that as a way to uh, both ask coordinating team members, research team members, and assembly members. And I can facilitate some of this Q&A. And if you don't want to, if uh, the chat is unavailable to you, you can also unmute yourself, or you can use the raise hand function. And I can call on you to ask your question. So thank you again to our assembly members. Thank you uh, to our legislators and elected officials for attending today. Um, and we'll open it up for a Q&A discussion. Mike. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Alex Yabara. I'm the state representative for District 13. A uh, question for the whole group, but mostly who's ever in charge here. Did you guys look at the recommendations from the Washington Advisory Energy Committee that was assembled all last year? I was a part of that group. Then we talked about everything you are basically talking about in uh, specific detail with um, experts from across the state. Um, so have you guys looked at the report or anything from that report at all? Great, thank you, Alex, for that um, question. And so the question is, uh, there was a report about energy policy um, released and whether we looked at uh, anything from that report. Um, I will take a first go, but invite other coordinating team members. Um, I think that report specifically, we. Uh, I don't think we actually looked at that report specifically, though we had a lot of energy policy experts as well as utility experts present on various aspects uh, of energy, energy related emissions and opportunities to reduce greenhouse gases within the energy sector. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity to also continue to crosswalk these recommendations with existing work that is being done across the state as well. Um, 
Does another coordinating team member want to offer additional insight as well? Yeah, I can jump in here, Mike, uh, Gretchen Muller, part of the coordinating team. So as a point of process for people's assemblies, only the information that's brought forward by presenters and or assembly members is what is shared uh, as part of the discussions. So unless that document was brought forward by either a presenter and or an assembly member, it would not have been included. So that is, that's how the process works and as per the rule book that we followed. Thank you, Gretchen. I'm gonna go over to Jeff Wilson, um, who has their hand raised. Thank you. Uh, I really had a question for one of the panelists that uh, introduced himself. So I don't know if I'm out of order, uh, Mike, on this. Oh, sorry, can you say that again? Yes, I, I hope I'm not out of order. I had a question for one of the panelists that was oh. introduced or the panel. Yeah, you're not out of order. Feel free to ask your question. All right, and, and thank you, by the way. Thank you for the engaging and very interesting conversation and invite. I, I, I'll stay on as long as I can. Um, Steve from Bellevue, I appreciated your, uh, your, your offering on the acquisition of alternative uh, fuels type uh, vehicles, electric vehicles. Um, it's no secret I drive one. Um, and I'm a massive supporter of trying to p clear a path of lease resistance for more people to acquire them. One of my concerns though is I'm, I'm, I need some uh, education on offerings of owners and operators of alternative vehicles. How do we pay our fair share of uh, maintenance if we're sharing the road um, you know, you, you had me at your discussions. I love that, but I, uh, help me out here with some input, uh, from anybody on, uh, you know, sharing uh, the maintenance aspect of what we're all going to need to share. Yeah. I mean, the, the lack of gas tax on electric vehicles, obviously, uh, there, there's going to be, have to be some sort of replacement on, on, on paying fair share. And, uh, I, I don't have a, a specific answer to that just to say that, that as these policies go into play, as, as policies start getting written based on, on recommendations such as these, uh, that's one of the many, many questions that would have to be answered. Great, thank you, Steve. Does any other assembly members want to offer additional perspectives to Jeff's question? I guess I'll I'll comment on that. Uh, I I agree with the concern. I agree that there is a uh, imbalance in uh, it, as we move to having more people relying on electric vehicles that don't have the same tax structure uh, for use as the um, as the gas powered vehicles. You do certainly have a hollowing out of that tax base, and you certainly have a hollowing out of um, the capacity to be able to afford. Um, transportation. And so, yeah, I, I think it does really prompt a rethinking of the way that uh, transportation taxes uh, are structured within the state. Great. Thank you, Curtis. So uh, we have another question from Representative Cindy Ryu, uh, and this is for any of the assembly members. Um, what did you like most about this process? I felt that this process was very well run by your group, Mike. Uh, the coordinating team walked with us through this whole process and really made sure that everybody's voice was heard. That was impressive. I, I can't say enough about the assembly process. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Mike, can I give an answer to you real quick? Oh, yeah, um, please do. So one of the things that I enjoyed was when we were in our groups in each session, we were in different groups with different people. And so even though we all couldn't be in the same room together, we still had an opportunity to collaborate with others. We weren't always in one specific group. So I appreciated that about the process. Great, thank you, Juanita. When, when we first began, I didn't think there was any way that we could come to consensus 
with that many people and that many initiatives and, and recommendations. And somehow we were able to do it, mostly based upon how the coordinating team herded the cats. So we did learn a lot in the process. Thank you, Barry. I also wanted uh, Teresa put an answer in the chat. Uh, I liked how we were able to come together in small groups, working through issues and coming to consensus. Teresa also said the super fun part was the waterfall chat, <laughs> which was uh, a way we got a lot of uh, answers to a lot of different questions, both related to the assembly and just getting to know each other. So thank you, Teresa. Any other assembly members um, want to chime in on this question? I'll just add in, uh, I really enjoyed the bipartisan participation and support and, uh, uh, and uh, unity that uh, the group had uh, from this ram uh, random sampling of uh, folks across the state. Great. Thank you, Curtis. So we had another question from Representative Ryu. Um, there is a current bill that incentivizes electric bikes. Uh, what do you all think? And I think this is directed to the assembly members. So um, welcome your thoughts around this. Electric bikes are expensive. And sometimes it's difficult to incentivize something that is much more than a regular bike. I don't know how much more one could incentivize it. I don't know that I have an answer to it, but it's it's kind of like the Peloton aspect when it's things are very expensive. Do you really need a deal? Thank you. One interesting thing to consider with that too is that electric bikes are probably much more useful in cities and more urbanized areas that are more densely packed, but for rural communities, that's not going to be a great solution. As far as uh, reducing traffic on the roads, every in incremental vehicle that can be removed from the road does benefit the, um, uh, the transportation for everyone else who is using a vehicle on the road. So that's, that is certainly a benefit to, concern, uh, to consider. And if it could make a, the difference between uh, someone uh, acquiring a second vehicle versus uh, making do with a, uh, with a, a, a bicycle, uh, that's something to consider. My wife and I, uh, we, we've made do with just having one vehicle between the two of us and uh, supplement that with bikes. And the incentives could be on the business side as well. If there's people in the state, they're trying to make them more cost effective, more efficient, lighter, uh, maybe able to be used in a, a, you know, not a paved road environment, something that's, you know, gravel or something like that. Uh, incentives could go to businesses helping with that as well. It wouldn't just all have to go to the end user. Great, thank you all. So um, it's, uh, we have two minutes left. So we have time for one more question. Well, um, there's one question or comment from Representative Sharon uh, Schumacher uh, about talking about the value of e-bikes or is this not the space? Um, if, I guess if there's another question for the assembly members, it'd be great to hear that um, before. Speaking to that point, I know in the uh, urban areas um, that um, the businesses that are trying to expand have a very limited uh, uh, amount of uh, parking space that they can allocate uh, due to the uh, building codes here. And so that's been encouraging uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to encourage their, uh, uh, their employees to bike or use other forms of transportation to get to the office as, uh, uh, as a constraint. Thanks, Curtis. All right, we have uh, uh, Liz Lovelet uh, with her hand raised. So 
Thank you. Um, I'm Senator Lovelet from the 40th District in the heart of the Salish Sea. Uh, just wanted to say that this has been really informative, but wanted to comment a little to the timing of some of these things and wanted to see, you know, at this point in session, most of the bills that are out are kind of, they're moving, they've got a lot of momentum. I just want to know if you were all willing to meet with us and talk these priorities during interim when we have the opportunity to go to dig more deeply and work on policy development. Um, in a more collaborative fashion. Thank you. Great, thank you for and that, that question, yes. Senator. <laughs> we appreciate you asking. Yeah, we could, you know, these are these are the kinds of conversations that during this time of year, we generally only have 15 minute appointments because we're running from committee to committee and working on the floor. So, you know, coming in on those kind of off months for us to really talk about, um, you know, the the planning effort for that, that upcoming legislative session would be really valuable, I would say, to us as legislators. I think the value of this is it gives a, a temperature reading from across the state of uh, that it, all of these policies are uh, generally welcomed uh, by all of uh, the, the political spectrum that's participated in that. So I think that that's a good signal to the legislature about the type of, uh, of policies to pursue. Thank you, Senator Lovelet, for offering that suggestion. It seems like there is uh, interest um, from some of the assembly members to continue these conversations moving forward. So with that, um, we are now at 1.16 on my clock, so just uh, about on time. I want to take another moment to just thank the uh, senators and representatives who were able to join us on the call. Uh, I wanna thank the assembly members for just all of the great work and the contributions uh, you've done over the past several months for this process. Um, and finally, I just wanna uh, remind everyone that we recorded today's session um, and you can access it, uh, the recording on our YouTube page, which you can find via our website. And Gretchen just put the website in the chat for everyone, which is, www.walkclimateassembly.org. So with that, thank you again for everyone attending. I hope everyone has a great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You.